So thank you, uh, Eric and James, for the opportunity. I don't see the slides yet. But. We have Dr. Rujiki's slides. Thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about outcomes and complications of stent placement, and I think that um, which one do I do here? I think that the uh, most important uh, uh, factor and the theme of these um, of, of my talk is that stents are not without complications. So here are my disclosures. None of these are going to be relevant for what I'm talking about today. Uh, as you've heard from Jeff and and uh, Jose and some others. Um, you know, stents, though, they are a doable procedure. You do have to be thoughtful about when you're going to place them and for what reason, uh, because complication rates are not uh, insignificant. For example, uh, self-expanding metal stents for uh, malignant esophageal problems do work most of the time, 90% dysphagia success, uh, but there is a well over 50% adverse event rate and even a 2% mortality, which I'll go into exactly what uh, can predict those. Um, when it comes to um, malignant esophageal stents, I'm, I'm stenting, uh, you do want to consider uh, uh, covered stents uh, in terms of um, tumor ingrowth. It can de decrease that. Uh, obviously, covered stents, though, do come with a, a price, though, with migration. Uh, malignant tracheoesophageal fistulas, uh, covered stents, actually, are very effective for palliating this. Uh, we can't, there are some studies that have shown even up to 100% success rates, so it's something to keep in mind when you do have an inoperable situation with somebody and, and uh, they are suffering from chronic aspiration from, from a fistula. And you can also, a, a lot of the uh, data, which I'm not going to show on, on certain fistula closures like gastric bypass leaks and so forth, a lot of those outcomes are actually very similar. Sometimes up to 80 percent you can get some healing from an early anastomotic leak. So specific complications, I think first of all, you have to be thoughtful about, you know, what am I stenting in the esophagus? Am I stenting a proximal lesion, a middle, or a distal lesion? Proximal lesions, you can typically uh, stent as long as you have at least a centimeter uh, between the UES and the area that you are stenting. Uh, you do want to be careful about the size of the stent that you use. These stents come in different sizes, 18 millimeters, 23 millimeters, and obviously the larger caliber stents are nice for uh, decreasing migration, but you have to be a little bit careful about airway compression, for example, for proximal lesion. We do see tumor in growth, which I'll get into a little bit more in a slide or two. Stent migration has been talked about quite a bit. Uh, you, we do see stent migration up to 10% of the time uh, in not covered stents. Chest pain, very common complication. Again, you use a wider stent in order to prevent migration, and the price you're going to pay is that that patient's going to feel it more, and so you're going to have to be prepared for more chest pain in those patients. And then GERD and aspiration, probably the most common reason that somebody would have an adverse event, uh, as has been brought up before, is in these patients, uh, typically you are going to have to really be concerned and, and, and prepared to manage their airway before placing uh, a stent. So if somebody comes in with a obstructing esophageal tumor and you rush them off to the uh, uh, GI suite or the endo suite or the OR uh, to stent them and you haven't thought about the fact that when they uh, are induced and undergo general anesthesia, there are contents in the esophagus that they can e easily aspirate. So be prepared for that. Make sure that you are communicating well with your anesthesiologist and, um, uh, and, and again, don't take that lightly because that is one of the most common causes for an adverse event. Pressure necrosis and fistula we do see in uh, about 2%. And then bleeding is a very rare complication, but if you get it, it can be a high mortality problem. And so many uh, studies that have shown uh, uh, bleeding complications, for example, most commonly due to tumors that are invading the aorta. Uh, if you stent that, you are going to uh, put yourself at risk for that patient coming back with a uh, uncontrollable and life-threatening bleed. And so be very, uh, again, thoughtful about uh, looking at preoperative films, making sure that you understand uh, the extent of the tumor, where it is, what's it, what it is invading. Migration. So this the picture that I'm showing you is a patient of my own, actually. Um, and uh, I, I do actually regularly suture uh, my stents. And of, of course, in, in this case, I didn't think I needed to. Um, a few days later, he uh, 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 started having some abdominal pain. We got x-rays, and you can see the stent there. It took us about four hours to remove uh, using double balloon enteroscopy. Uh, but so migration is not a small issue. Um, metal plastic covered stents used during neoadjuvant therapy is becoming less common because of migration. Neoadjuvant therapy obviously is on the rise if you deal with a lot of esophageal cancer. Uh, 
quite frankly, the standard of care uh, for T2 lesions or above. And I would be very hesitant to stent those people now because the chemotherapy and radiation is very effective. We see a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of response and tumor shrinkage. And if you stent that lesion prior to that, it is likely that that stent will migrate and then you will have problems. So um, this is a, um, a patient uh, of mine, an 85-year-old, who uh, was not a candidate for esophagectomy. He had a very proximal esophageal tumor. So this is only about uh, three centimeters distal to the uh, uh, upper esophageal sphincter. Uh, clearly, you can say he had pretty significant dysphagia because the lumen is tiny. So um, I'm, I'm showing this video because I'm going to show you that we were successfully uh, able to stent this tumor. Uh, but that's not the point of this. The point will, will be that uh, he had a few months of good relief, and here you can see, by the way, the UAS right there, so we had uh, a good space between the two. He actually had an excellent outcome from this. He was able to tolerate um, uh, liquids and some soft foods, and, and his quality of life improved quite a bit. Five months later, this is what we saw. So I, I put tumor ingrowth, though it's not really tumor ingrowth. We use a covered stent. Uh, but he grew tumor around and above and proximal to the uh, stent. So unfortunately, five months later, we were um, uh, in a situation where uh, we had to uh, put a feeding tube, and uh, ultimately he went to hospice and passed away. But uh, you know, tumor in growth is something that you have to think about, or tumor growth around the stent or above or proximal to it. I'm going to move on to gastroduodenal stents and end with colon stents. Uh, in terms of technical success for gastroduodenal stents. It's very high, 90%. A lot of that has to do with the through-the-scope deployment. Um, most people, 9 out of 10, are going to be able to eat at least a mechanical soft diet after placement. But if you're in a situation, uh, if there are mostly surgeons in the room uh, or even a gastroenterologist, when you are thinking about whether or not I should stent a uh, malignancy, for example, uh, in the uh, pyloric area, uh, or the duodenal area, one thing to think about is whether or not that patient is looking at a long or short-term uh, li lifespan. Because if it's short-term, I would favor a stent. I think it's, uh, um, the short-term results are good. You get, uh, you know, very minimal recovery is needed from that. And, um, and, and so I would favor that. But if you have a patient, and I will always uh, discuss um, you know, with the oncologist what the life expectancy is. Because if you have a life expectancy of one or two years, for example, then uh, a bypass may actually be a better option. And uh, for many of the reasons that we've already talked about in terms of tumor ingrowth and migration and so forth. So again, something to, to consider. There, there have been uh, randomized trials that have shown exactly what I'm, I'm stating here. Some of the uh, specific complications for uh, gastroduodenal stents include perforation, bleeding, migration, restenosis, uh, biliary obstruction. So uh, one thing to consider if you're in the second portion of the duodenum needing to stent a lesion is that you may need to place a biliary stent first. And again, this is a patient of mine. This patient is uh, interesting. So uh, we did an esophagectomy and gastric pull-up uh, that went very well. A year later, he came back. Uh, and, and uh, with jaundice, and unfortunately, we found that he had a, a secondary uh, pancreatic cancer. So this guy has probably the worst luck in the world. So a year after esophageal cancer that he was uh, disease-free from, he comes back with a pancreatic cancer. Uh, we sent him to our hepatobiliary surgeons. His surgery went great. And then a year after that, he came back, and he was uh, obstructed. As a matter of fact, he obstructed um, and uh, perforated his gastric conduit in his chest. Um, and so uh, we were able to clean out his chest and, and fix that part, but we had to take care of the distal obstruction first. And uh, so we placed a, a gastroduodenal stent uh, through the scope. It was actually not easy, but we were able to get it in there. Uh, but unfortunately, um, he did suffer from uh, external tumor compression that basically uh, continued to make him obstructed. So uh, though the stent placement was successful, the outcome was not great for him. Ultimately, he actually went to hospice. This is a depressing, uh, depressing talk here, but he went to hospice as well. Um, so lastly, colonic stents. So th this, these are probably the most commonly used uh, in this country. It's been found to be a successful bridge to surgery in, in uh, 60 to 85% of patients. Again, technical success is high. Um, clearly, lower mortality and morbidity than taking a patient to the operating room with an obstructing colon tumor and giving them a, a diverting ostomy, you're now subjecting that patient to typically three surgeries. Um, so stents very appealing in this area. 
does reduce, re reduce the need for stoma from almost one out of two patients to less than 10%. But there are complications, again, so don't take these lightly. Uh, perforation is uh, one of the most common. Uh, one, one important factor, which I think may have been mentioned earlier, but you know, you, you want to avoid dilating prior to placing the stent. That does increase the risk of perforation. So if you have an obstructing colon tumor, you are going to stent it. Do not dilate prior. Migration obviously happens for all the reasons that Dr. Uh, or Professor Marks talked about in terms of a peristalsing GI tract uh, with, you know, uh, hard stool coming through, uh, not uncommon to see migration. And then these can obstruct, and obviously, as you have potential problems with dysphagia from proximal stents, you can have tenesmus from distal stents. One important thing that has been found, a few studies have shown a very significant increase uh, in perforation when patients are undergoing or going to receive anti-angiogenics uh, after stent placement. So one thing to keep in mind is, again, communication with the oncologist. What is the plan? Is if the patient is going to receive anti-angiogenics, then you might want to be careful about stenting. That might be a situation where you want to consider surgery, actually. So in conclusion, again, stenting, technical success as we see in all parts of the GI tract, whether esophagus, uh, stomach, duodenum, colon, the technical success is very high, but adverse events are not low, so do not take stenting lightly. I think as Dr. Mark said, he stented a lot more before, has stented a lot less uh, recently, and that's just because, again, I think people take for granted that stents are going, or any endoscopic procedure for that matter, is going to be low morbidity, and that is not the case. So you have to consider the risks and benefits as well as other options, and, but what I think is most important is having all the tools in your toolbox. I think if you have all the tools in your toolbox, you're going to make the right decision for that patient. So thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions.